hitting share. Hello, and welcome to Herb Corner with Jen and Mary. Uh, my name is Mary Bear Shannon. I am a reference librarian, and I am here with my colleague, Jennifer Kuhns, who is also a reference librarian. We're both at the Haverford Township Free Library, uh, and we are so glad that you could join us for Herb Corner with Jen and Mary. Um, we created this program a couple of months ago because we both uh, really are interested and, and love herbs and are really interested in how um, we use them both in cooking and for well-being. Um, so we are really uh, excited to be here and to talk about some of the herbs that uh, we're interested in uh, and not only like to use but are interested in learning more about. Um, so Jennifer, uh, we have a uh, just a, something we want to say before we get started. Hi, I'm Jennifer, a reference librarian, as Mary has said, and I would like to give you a disclaimer that we are not uh, health professionals or practitioners. We just have information that we're sharing with you, and please check with your healthcare practitioner, doctor, whoever you go for your health information um, before trying any of these herbs that I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm not prescribing anything. I'm just talking about information that I know about these herbs from what I have read and from my own personal experience. Yes, and we're, we're librarians. We're information specialists. So uh, we know how to, to research um, and uh, have uh, really uh, worked hard to make sure we have the correct information. But we as, as Jennifer said, we're, we're not health professionals um, and, and really want you to make sure that you go see uh, your doctor before you um, implement anything uh, that we have suggested today. Um, so anyway, Jennifer, um, I know that uh, you've done some, uh, you've been doing some thinking and some reading and research on uh, herbs uh, for well-being, especially around the coronavirus. So um, my first question to you is, um, so what are some of the advantages of using herbs medicinally as opposed to pharmaceuticals? And um, yeah, so. Yeah, so, um, so herbs are by and large pretty easy to use. They are oftentimes easy to grow. The, there are some herbs that are, have overall health benefits according to a lot of research. They have overall health benefits that can help with any kind of inflammatory disorders, which uh, coronavirus is turning into, turning out one of the problems with coronavirus with people who have long-term symptoms is this sort of uh, inflammatory situation. Um, so uh, a lot of these herbs can help with that. Um, the other thing, the other advantage of herbal treatments is that there are these emerging um, pathogens, whether they're viral or bacterial, that are resistant to your pharmaceutical treatments, like your antibiotics. So you're getting these, these uh, strains of pathogens that cannot be um, killed by, that have, that have developed resistance to pharmaceutical treatments. And herbal treatments tend to work better in this way. And in a way, sort of for, for millennia, plants have been able to protect themselves. They have chemicals in them that protect them against bacteria, for example. And so uh, they kind of have this inner wisdom in that way. Uh, so, so they can be, and, and they change over time in how they protect themselves. So that's another advantage is that there's no herbal treatment that has yet become antibiotic resistant, for example. Um, a lot of times the treatments are much cheaper and you, don't, you also don't have fillers and different kinds of other ingredients in herbs if you're taking just the plant itself. Um, so that can be an advantage. Um, there are also some disadvantages, uh, which- so, Is have, that your next slide? That was my next slide. Okay, here we go. <laughs> and that mostly has to do with just this lack of uh, of sort of standardization and regulation, um, especially in our country, we don't we don't have this in the United States. Some countries uh, are a little more advanced with this. So, but the way you can deal with that is you can grow your own plants. You can also always ask a librarian for sources and resources for finding places that might 
uh, be uh, have better standards. And you can also find a local farm that grows the herbs that you're looking for and maybe prepares them so that you're getting just the herb and not a whole lot of other things. And the other disadvantage is there's not a lot of evidence-based research, particularly in Western countries. So you can always ask a librarian for help to point you to sources that particularly that are uh, research that's been done outside of this country, especially in, um, in Africa and Asian countries as well, uh, that have just turned to these treatments more because actually, in, in, especially in uh, African countries, they're, they're just less expensive. And um, you don't have that problem with the uh, antibody, the resistance. So especially for mosquito-borne illnesses and things like that that are rampant in some of those countries. Can you talk yeah. about resistance and what that means in terms of traditional men medicines? Well, so like you have these, especially with bacterial, um, you'll have diseases like MRSA, which is, or VERSA, which is another one. I, I can't remember what the, um, what that acronym is, uh, vanamycin resistant. So, so like vanamycin is, is a antibiotic that's given for certain infections, um, urinary infections. And so VERSA is, is a new strain of this infection that is resistant to the vanamycin, which was usually given. Um, so that's an example of these, of these resistant um, so what kind of uh, herbs have you been researching about uh, for the coronavirus? Yeah, so uh, when I say coronavirus, so, so what I'm talking about here are, are herbs that have traditionally been used by herbalists for coronaviruses. <laughs> so the whole, that whole, you know, thing, C COVID or SARS-CoV-2, um, which is the new, this new coronavirus that we're dealing with, COVID-19 is the disease that happens because of that. Th that has some specific other things, other issues, but it is a coronavirus, so it has those spike proteins that, that come out. So, so there, there are a couple of things to consider. So the other thing that's great about herbs is that they are, the, when I say immune system, I mean, so they're kind of immune modulators or regulators as opposed to just like you know, totally revving up your immune system. Some of them will do that, but some of them are sort of modulators. So, okay. right. yeah, so, so they work more gently and more sort of synergistically with you. So the first one I wanna talk about is elder. What, um, what's this plan again? So elder or elderberry. Okay. Um, and you know what? This is a messed up slide because there's no, nothing that says what it is. <laughs> but we'll anyway. say it again. This is an elderberry bush. So elderberry. So elderberry, elderberry. or... Sambucus nigra, which is the uh, Latin name. So, uh, yeah, so we'll if, put this in the comments. Talk a little bit. We'll put that. We'll put that word in the comments so people. Yes. Know. I'm so sorry, I was doing this. Um, so this is pretty easy plant to grow. It gets. It it doesn't need a lot of special um, growing conditions. Usually, the berries and flowers are the part that's used, made into a syrup. Uh, many herbalists believe that it can be more powerful in in helping you your whole system work better and your immune system work better if if all the parts were used. So that would be the roots and the stems as well, and the bark. Um, the caution with this one is that it it is traditionally in large doses used as a purgative, so you don't want to take too much. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's what you're looking okay. for. So should I move on to the next one? Yes. Okay. So here's a here's another one. Um, so this one is astragalus. I don't know how to say the last part of it, but so one of the I'm, I'm giving you the Latin names because uh, you have the first name astragalus, and then you have the second, which gives you the specific type. And this specific type is also used um, for helping modulate and regulate your immune system. Um, it's a member of the legume family. Uh, usually it's the, so the part that's used is the root and it traditionally it's used cook and cooking in a soup or a stew. If you take a lot of it, it could rev up your immune system too much. So if you have any kind of autoimmune issue, you want to be careful of that. And of course, you know, disclaimer again, you want to check with your doctor before trying any of these, or you want to find a qualified herbalist to help you. 
Um, it's pretty easy to grow. Again, um, it's, it's very hardy. And it's, I'm sorry that keeps coming up on my computer. <laughs> Go away. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's pretty easy to grow also. And it's pretty, it has a pretty flower. It's very pretty. Okay. Yeah. And what's this next one? So this is Eleuthero, for short, uh, Eleuthero. This was, uh, there's a lot of research on this in uh, Russia. And it's also known as Siberian ginseng. So what this does, so that word adaptogenic. So when it says adaptogenic, this is something that is uh, purported to regulate the body's response to stress. And the research that they did in Russia was they did the research on rats and they would do these unkind things to rats basically. And they noticed that the rats that they gave the Eleuthero to, their body systems were much able to, much more able to deal with the stress that was incurred. Um, not that we haven't been under any stress in the last couple of months. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so this has been used, and I think it's might have been it's been used a lot in uh, in Bulgaria and Russia um, for. Uh, there's been a lot of research around that as a stress modulator. Um, and this, so this is a big woody, rangy, shrubby uh, plant, and it's weirdly tender. I say because apparently it's. It, it can be tender to frost, to early frost, like all the leaves will die, um, according to one herbalist that I saw on, on YouTube. So um, what else do I have to say about this one? So if, if it says, uh, you say it can propagate uh, from runners, does that mean it can take over your yard? <laughs> it, actually, it, this is not as invasive as some, as some of the herbs I'm gonna talk about. It could possibly do that. Um, it, it apparently does not grow well from, it's hard to grow from seed, but okay. runners will pop up. I don't think it's very invasive, but it's not, it's not like it'll do it, you know, in one whole season from what I understand. So, All right. So we'll go to the next one. Yeah, the next one. So this is Salvia um, Military Isa. It's from the sage family or the mint sage family of plants. Oh, and by the way, the previous, the Eleuthero, you use the bark, the part oh, used in the bark. Yeah. Anyway, so this one, uh, you, the, you use the dried root. This has an interesting, from what I've read about this herb, it has an interesting property in that, so you know the coronavirus, the reason it's called corona is its crown, it has those spike proteins, and apparently there's something about this, this particular type of salvia um, that when the, the, the spike protein comes into your system, it, uh, I'm trying to, it's, it's kind of, it, so there, there's an enzyme that's on our cells that makes it easier, like a, the AC2 receptor or something that, that sort of locks into the spike protein and then the, the spike protein can enter your cells and start replicating. The salvia somehow gets in the way of that. And it's sort of a complicated thing that I don't know how to explain, but <laughs> it has something to do with enzymes in your body and the salvia sort of gets in the way of of this spike protein entering into your cells. So this is how it can help with the immune, um, your immune system sort of fighting. fighting it's this. very pretty. And it's gorgeous, isn't it pretty? It's very pretty, yeah. Yes. All right, I we'll move on to the next one here. <laughs> okay, so here we are with our invasives. So Puaria lobata, otherwise known as uh, kudzu, the part that's used here is the root it is very invasive, especially in the South, in, in Southern states, although it's moving up to Northern states, partly because uh, our, our climate is warming a little bit and also uh, it's, just, it's just moving up. Um, so these are the herbs for, so when I say cytokine storm, this is what's uh, happening to some people who, uh, many people who are getting uh, coronaviruses and often it's the, the younger, healthier people, is that their immune systems go on to overdrive and so then you get this hyper inflammatory response where um, your T cells become these chemical messengers called cytokines. It's way more complicated than I'm describing, but I'm just sort of giving a real, real basic. And then you have what's, what a lot of people call cytokine storm. So the plants I'm about to talk about are these are help modulate the infl that inflammation. And so kudzu is one of them, and the part that you that is used is the root. 
kudzu is everywhere it's in disturbed a lot of like disturbed areas like vacant lots it'll take over it will you know kill other people other not other people <laughs> it'll kill other plants oh, but yeah. a lot of attention being given to, a lot of attention being given to getting, getting rid of it and how to get rid of it and it's so interesting because it, it's a very apparently very powerful plant for uh, uh, anti-inflammatory purposes and you know if, if, if you just pull it and and use the root um and then it's prepared in some herb, in an herbal fashion. You can either, however you prepare it, it's the root that has all that that power. So that's a real interesting plant. Um, what else do you have here? Oh, you've got more. <laughs> but wait, there's more. So here's another invasive. It's called a uh, Polygonum cuspidatum, and otherwise known as Japanese knotweed. There's some other common names for it. This has high levels of a resveratrol, which is a lot of people think that you can get it in red wine, but there's actually apparently more in this particular plant. Again, it's the root that's used. A lot like kudzu in the way it grows, it's part of the buckwheat family. So that's another plant. You use the root. You use the root, yes. All right, well, and is that it or do you have another slide here? I've got, I got two, two or three more. I'm gonna to try to go through them real quickly. Here we go. Um, so Scutellaria bicolensis, uh, skull cap, Chinese skull cap. There are a lot of different kinds of skull cap. This is the one particular uh, bic bicolensis is the important one. Beautiful plant. The root is used. Um, if you're purchasing, you want to look for roots that appear yellow because that means they're fresher. So that's another one that deals with inflammation. And then the but next one. So many of them are purple. <laughs> I know, right? And interestingly, this one, Isatis, if any species of Isatis, is used, um, the root actually ha is used for indigo dye, but it doesn't look like indigo. It actually looks, it's, it's uh, the part of the brassica family. So apparently it tastes like, you know, boiled cabbage. It's like, doesn't taste very good, but the, again, the root and the leaf are used. And um, you wanna make sure it's, there's some special considerations in this preparation. Uh, but yeah, it's part of the broccoli family and it kind of looks like a big, a big broccoli weed. <laughs> Oh, so. and here's some books. Um, yeah. Uh, before you do that, um, I've, I've got a couple other questions here. Um, so um, how might herbal researchers and practitioners know a particular herb could be useful for COVID-19? Um, so they, they, what they're going to do, so a lot of it is traditional uses over time. What has worked for things that, that are uh, in, inflammatory? Um, for example, what are things that help modulate the immune system? Most, if you, most of this research, like I said earlier, is going to be in Asian countries, African countries, where they, they're turning to these things more. So one of the, when I, yeah, so that, so the regular person doing research, you know, please ask your local librarian because they can help you, help you find information. Uh, or help you find sources for that information. Um, yeah. So, Jennifer, many of the herbs you've talked about today are unusual, um, and I haven't heard of them, um, especially for medicinal use. Uh, where did you find out about them? So yeah, if you go to that last slide, I'll show you the book that I read, that these books that I read, and, and this is uh, full disclosure, I have some autoimmune stuff that I uh, is probably Lyme related. And so I found this book, Healing Lyme, by an herbalist who uh, has he's just a very good, very, he does really rigorous research and he has a lot of, he has like a whole, all of his books have a, an index of listing all the research that he has gone through. And so these are the three books that, where I learned about all these interesting herbs I'd never heard of before. And so I started with the Lyme book, and then I was interested in the antibiotics, so I looked at that one, and then I turned to, you know, when coronavirus was a thing, I was like, oh, let me take out antivirals and see what's, what's in there. And then he also, this particular herbalist has, uh, on the internet, he has an addendum in a PDF form about COVID-19 that mentions pretty much most of, the, most of the herbs that he talks about. I'm sorry, there's like garden work going on in the background. <laughs> it's a little loud. Um, so, uh, and unfor I will say, unfortunately, Healing Lyme is a book that is in Delco's system. Mm -hmm. I feel like I ordered it for Haverford a couple of years ago, but I don't see it in the system anymore. Mm -hmm. And okay. um, I'm going to, uh, Herbal 
antivirals can be found uh, in a digital, as a digital title, I believe. Okay. I'm going to- On, on Libby? Um, I believe it is on Libby. And I'm also going to try to, to have these ordered for our library, the, you know, the, uh, the books themselves. Okay. So, yeah. All right, well, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I just, um, uh, there's just so much to chew on there, uh, <laughs> um, you know, figuratively and uh, literally. Um, <laughs> yeah, and just a reminder that um, please do not use any of this, uh, any, of, any of the things that we have mentioned without consulting with your doctor. Uh, we are not medical professionals. We are uh, herb enthusiasts, uh, but that, that's, and we are reference librarians, so we do know how to get to the root of things and get the, uh, get the, the true story um, uh, using our resources, but we are not medical professionals. Um, so anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit about what I've been thinking about in terms of herbs. Uh, I usually do the, uh, uh, our, our talk about um, herbs for cooking, uh, and I have been thinking a lot about cooking, um, uh, cooking with, with uh, uh, lavender. Um, it's, it is one of those things that people use um, uh, for um, usually for well-being, but there are ways to use it in cooking. Um, this is just a picture of my own uh, little English lavender plant on my deck. Uh, but before we get started, Jennifer, could you tell us um, more about, um, you know, the, some of the um, things that you can use lavender for with your, for your well-being before I start talking about cooking? Sure. Um, there's a lot of, I don't know if I'm, if I'm on the screen right now, I can't tell. But, um, but yep. I, <laughs> now, now you're on screen. <laughs> I wasn't. So, um, but first I want to say, you know, Mary has made the uh, statement about us being librarians and being able to, to find sources and also assess those sources. So when I look about for information for sources for herbs, um, I'm going to be really careful about the source that I'm getting that information from. And one of the sources that I like is called um, evidence, evidence.com. And Again, but I will go back to saying that there's not a lot of research in the United States about herbs. However, for lavender, most of this research is about the aromatherapy and also ingestion. And so most of the evidence supports that this can be effective as a, a, in a specific kind of oral supplement, ingestion, and um, aromatherapy for anxiety that there's pretty good evidence to support that it helps with anxiety and that it also can help with uh, feeling relaxed. So these studies have to do with self-reporting. So people after taking, you know, or um, whether they're, they're sniffing or, or taking a supplement, they're reporting that they feel more relaxed um, or they're, they're reporting that they feel less anxious. Another study uh, which had pretty good uh, I'm going to say consensus over, like there were, I think there were seven studies, talked about uh, improved sleep quality that people reported with, I think this is also with the essential oil, sort of aromatherapy wise. So, uh, oh, and then there was also an interesting study that showed a decrease in heart rate if it was used over 12 weeks. The aromatherapy was used over a long period of time that actually over time decreased heart rate. So that's what I know about lavender so far. Well, well, thank you. Uh, now I feel even better about, um, you know, using it. Uh, I just think it smells amazing. Um, and uh, so it, it feels good to, to know that there are some other real uh, benefits. As I said, this is my little lavender plant. I have actually never um, grown lavender. Um, and so that's what got, kind of piqued my interest this summer. Um, my plant's doing really well. It it tends to do really well in the heat. Um, and so uh, it's, uh, and it has now bloomed, which is really exciting. Um, of course, I don't really have enough lavender to actually use. So um, I did use some dried lavender, but um, I was just curious about how people use it in cooking. Um, and so I, um, I did some, some research myself. Um, of course, when I think about lavender, I think about the amazing lavender fields in France, uh, which um, are, are really blooming right now. The, the time is between 
uh, blooming time is between June and August. Um, and there are, uh, play this is mostly in Provence. Um, so in the kind of the southern uh, part of France, southwestern part of France, I guess it's southwestern part of France, um, that tends to be a little drier. It's closer to Spain. Um, and uh, so that's when I, when I think of, uh, you know, lavender and uh, people actually do tours to actually tour uh, the lavender fields of France be when they bloom because they really are, you know, just amazing looking. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, that's, that's kind of the beginning of, of my, um, uh, my work, uh, or my research on lavender. Um, and the other thing that I, I kind of um, did some research into was just kind of the history of, of lavender. Um, it, we have evidence that goes back uh, 2,500 years to ancient Egypt. Um, when lavender oil was used as a perfume, especially during mummification. Um, and the ancient Greeks and the Romans also bathed in water infused with fragrant, fragrant lavender buds, uh, which we actually still do today. Um, um, then later in the Middle Ages, lavender started to be used in both culinary pre preparations and medicine. Um, so, um, you know, over time, uh, the herb grew in popularity over across the Mediterranean, including uh, integrating into the cuisine of Spain and France and Italy and England by the 17th century. Um, and since then, English lavender uh, has become the most popular choice for culinary purposes, uh, given its mild peppery and floral flavor. I, that's what I have is English lavender in my um, growing, uh, growing in my little window box. Um, so people use the flower buds, the leaves and the stems of lavender can be used uh, fresh or dried um, and uh, in dishes ranging from sweet floral desserts to heartier meat dishes. Um, and uh, it, you know, kind of getting back to France, uh, uh, lavender was um, kind of brought to France around 600 BC uh, by traders from um, the Eis uh, Iaris, which are uh, then a Greek outpost in the Mediterranean near the modern day Toulon. Uh, however, it was the Romans, um, and uh, which we know are enth enthusiastic bathers who first learned to extract the plant's essential oil, uh, who named the plant lavender from the Latin lavar or to wash. Um, so it really does well in the uh, Provence, uh, Provence uh, climate. Um, and um, they are uh, because it's it's so dry and and many artists have actually depicted uh, lavender in in their artwork so um, it, it really is uh, got got a, a very deep uh, deep history um, so that's that's kind of the beginning of my uh, my research on lavender did you have some questions for me Jennifer oh, oh. I mean, we're going to talk about cooking, I guess. Yes, Mary, I, uh, hold on a sec. <laughs> um, I'm so sorry, Mary. I don't know where my questions are. Oh, that's okay. Um, so we were going to, we were going to talk about cooking. Um, and um, one of the things that um, I did some research on was, um, you know, what we should keep in mind when we're um, cooking with lavender. Um, and um, I was going to show you, uh, this was actually the first thing that I cooked, but I, I am going to talk about, um, you know, that you need to make sure that um, you, you use um, uh, culinary lavender. Um, it, it, it is, um, you don't want to just, uh, um, there are types of lavender that are really used for the essential oils, um, but there is, uh, it is important that uh, when you look for lavender to cook with, you get what's called culinary lavender. Um, and I think really the best way, I, I did do a number of dishes with lavender, um, and I think it's really best to either infuse the lavender or to grind it. Um, the little buds, if uh, sometimes people don't like to come across a, a whole lavender bud in a dish. So if you were, if you're not going to infuse it, infusing, we've talked about that, is uh, usually with some kind of hot liquid and that you let it sit. 
um, and then you drain it off. Um, and and you, what you're left is the, the infused uh, portion of um, uh, whatever liquid you have put the, the, the lavender in. Or you can also uh, grind it. Uh, and I, that's another possible way of, of using lavender. Um, and then some of the typical infusing liquids are, are honey, uh, simple syrup, or milk. Um, and um, the other thing to, to note about lavender is that uh, a little bit goes a long way. It's like oregano. Um, uh, so use, use sparingly. Uh, it definitely has a strong flavor. Um, and one of the recommendations that I, I found was to, to pair it with some other strong flavors. Um, it, it, it can stand up uh, to, to stronger flavors. Um, so English lavender is more likely used for culinary um, uh, uses um, uh, just because it is a, 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 it's got a, um, a sweeter uh, it's got the sweetest fragrance um, and uh, even the gray green stems can be used in place of rosemary in some recipes. Um, uh, French lavender tends to have a, a stronger pine flavor um, and um, it's a kind of less ideal for cooking. Um, so um, so the big question is, you know, where do I find it? I had no idea. Yeah, what yeah. if I don't have a lavender plant? Yeah, um, and, and I didn't really have enough to cook from my lavender. So um, I, I found mine at the Headnut, um, which is right here in Havertown. Um, there's also, uh, you can also get it at Whole Foods. Uh, it's one of those uh, uh, spices that you might not get at Giant, but you could get at a place like Whole Foods. Um, and then this time of year, because it's blooming, sometimes you can get it as a cut flower. Um, and I know that Trader Joe's um, sometimes will have cut lavender this time of year. So if you're looking to use fresh lavender, you can also, I mean, I got my plant from a local garden center um, and often you'll be able to find it in the spice section. So uh, again, I found my plant, um, you know, just at, at Tadio's uh, around the corner. Um, and I'm go ahead. thinking local farm markets might be growing them too. Yep. For the fresh yep. plants. Yeah, and uh, local CSAs too. Uh, some I know my local CSA has has an herb share. Um, you can actually get herbs every uh, every I think it's every other week, um, and I think they do include lavender in one of their one of their contents um, uh, for 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 the the local. Uh, a community sustained agriculture programs at, from one of the local farms. Um, so yeah, so anyway, um, I guess I'll start to show you what I made. Uh, I, I subjected my poor family to all of these recipes. Um, I don't know how they actually feel about lavender. I think they like the smell. Uh, I don't know if they knew what, what they were getting into when I, uh, when I made all these dishes. The first thing I made was a, a honey lavender ice cream, which I think has um, uh, become a little bit more popular. Um, as you see here, I infused the lavender. I used dried lavender in the milk. Um, I got it to just below simmering because you don't want to boil milk. Um, and then I let it sit for about 15 minutes. Um, uh, this was an a, a, a custard, um, so I did use egg yolks. Um, and as you can see on the side, I this is a mixture of of sugar and egg yolks and and a, and about a third of a cup of honey. Um, and then eventually, actually this morning, I actually churned my my ice cream, um, and I was really thrilled that it actually churned because sometimes if I don't put the tub in long enough in my freezer, I have a hard time. Um, and the ingredients aren't cold enough. Sometimes it doesn't churn. So I was really excited that this churned for me this morning and um, it's quite good. Um, and I have heard people, um, you know, making honey lavender ice cream to sleep better at night. So uh, oh, I actually nice. <laughs> have heard that um, uh, as, a, um, as kind of a remedy for, for having some trouble with sleeping. The next thing I made, was a lavender tea bread. Um, uh, it's also can be known as lavender tea cakes. And I have actually seen it with kind of a, 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 um, a powdered sugar frosting on the top, but I just did the regular bread. And as you can see, there are pieces of lavender in here. I think if I had to do this over again, I probably would have uh, chopped the lavender a little bit more. It did not 
call for an infusion. It actually called for it to be uh, in, in the bread. This is just a, a quick bread um, uh, with some sugar in it. Um, but it was a little strange to kind of come across a lavender bud. And I think if, if I had to do it over, I probably would have ground this um, to, to uh, make those uh, little pieces a little smaller um, for the bread. Um, but this was, this was quite good and it just smelled heavenly in the oven. Um, the other thing I made was a lavender infused lemonade. As you can see, I had my, my husband, which is just half of him. Uh, he was uh, squeezing lemons for me. Um, I also infused the lavender in a, um, in a simple syrup, um, uh, which I did here. And that's, that sat for about 10 or 15 minutes to cool down. Uh, and then I strained it just like I did with the milk. I strained the lavender so um, it was just the, um, the essence of the lavender left and not the little buds. Um, and then the final product uh, was, it was interesting, it, it does have kind of a little pinkish hue to it, which I thought was kind of interesting because um, I didn't actually see that um, when I was uh, infusing, but it does kind of give it a, a bit of a, um, uh, it, does, it does color the whatever you are infusing with, uh, as did the, the, the ice cream too. So it was very refreshing. Um, and then lastly is um, I made Herbs de Provence. And um, uh, it's interesting because uh, Herbs de Provence traditionally in France are is thyme, savory, oregano, rosemary, and marjoram. Um, but Americans apparently really like lavender in their Herbs de Provence. Um, so I, that's what I made. Uh, I made a uh, mixture. I just used dried herbs um, uh, and, um, and, and um, put that all together. Um, that is something that you could use for, um, you know, uh, heartier dishes, uh, stews, um, poultry. Um, you could also use it with pork. I've used herbs to Provence. Um, and there are, um, they are really, um, uh, there's some great French recipes. Uh, there's uh, chicken and, uh, well, Ina Garten hat makes a, a chicken and 40 cloves of garlic, uh, which sounds um, a lot, but when you roast it, uh, it, 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 the garlic becomes this kind of sweet, nutty flavor. Um, but that also uh, requires use, use of herbs de Bravant. So uh, I'm planning on, on giving that a try uh, soon. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think it's interesting that North Americans or, or Americans uh, like lavender, but real traditionalist uh, people from France don't, don't put uh, lavender in, uh, in, their, um, in their herbs de Provence. So, um, so uh, that's, that's it in terms of, of cooking. Um, I did have some, uh, some tips about uh, uh, growing and maybe I'll go back. I don't know if I can get back to my original plant here. But um, one of the things that I learned was that um, it really does love full sun. Um, and um, you got to be careful. I mean, it's doing really great right now because it's super hot. Um, you have to be careful that you don't overwater it because the root ball will, will start to rot. Um, it does much better if it dries out completely. Um, uh, and, and, and is much better. Uh, so well-drained soil and full sun is really some of the best, um, the best climate. The other great news is that it's a perennial, so it will come back next year. Um, and people, um, you know, have it just growing in their yards and it will come back year after year. Um, uh, in terms of spacing, uh, you want to space them about one to three feet apart because I guess they will. This is really close. So at the end of this season, I will probably put this in my yard uh, and give it some more space for it to really grow. Um, and um, I think the other thing is uh, that um, uh, you, you um, plant your lavender with the top of the root ball, even, uh, even with the soil line. Uh, and backfill soil around the plant and press firmly all around. Um, and then um, water to compress the soil and remove and air, uh, air pockets. Um, in the coming weeks, once you've planted it, uh, only water your lavender if both the plant and the overall conditions are very dry. Remember, lavender thrives on fast draining soil 
uh, and not does not prefer to have wet feet or a wet ball so uh, because it will rot so anyway that's that's what I had about lavender I um, I was very in, enthusiastic about what I learned about it um, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this plant coming back next year so and I think I think that's all I had to say about um, about grow, uh, cooking and, and growing lavender. Uh, thank you for all the information about the health benefits. Um, and um, just again, another disclaimer, everything that we have uh, to, to share um, um, is really should not be construed as me medical advice. Uh, we do encourage you to, um, to seek out your, uh, your GP uh, about any, um, any of the, the herbs that we've talked about uh, before you start and use them, so. Um, I guess that is, that's it. And unless Jennifer, you had other herb things to talk about. Well, I just want to say I, I thank you so much for your for your wonderful presentation. I I, I just love the I, I just love what you do. I want to come and live at your house and eat your food. It's just so yeah. <laughs> lavender ice cream. I mean, what could be better? You have the milk, which is the tryptophan, I guess, or like, and then you have the lavender, and that can help you sleep. And then you have the honey, which is just like awesome. Um, and it was also interesting for me to to learn about like how the different kinds of lavender, how like that French is more piney. Um, and I don't like that smell as much as the other kind of lavender, actually, when oh, I... The English, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. English. So, and, you know, there's also, also, you can get lavender in an essential oil too. Uh, and people like to use that both, you know, in, a, in an oil diffuser or just put it on a pot on the stove. Um, that, that can also... Uh, have uh, more um, olfactory benefits, uh, and um, and can you know we can um, we can realize some of those benefits that you talked about. So, so I guess that's it to, for today's herb corner with Jen and Mary. Thanks for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next month. We always meet on the fourth Wednesday of each month at three p.m. So look for us then, and thanks for joining us. Bye. Awesome.